So um, I've uh, decided to present uh, a talk which was my uh, reprise lecture at the SIAM meeting in Chengdu last year, uh, about 12 months ago, um, exactly. Uh, so the topic is control of PDs with moving boundaries where the, uh, the, boundaries, uh, the boundaries move in accordance to um, uh, ordinary differential equations. I will cover both parabolic and hyperbolic systems, but the emphasis will be on parabolic systems where uh, global results are achievable in contrast to hyperbolic, where I've only seen the possibility of achieving local results. <clears throat> These results uh, are by Shimon Koga and Huan Yu, uh, who uh, both recently graduated with, with me and are both at UCSD at postdoc as postdocs still. Uh, the, the topic that um, I will talk about first is parabolic systems of the so-called Stefan type. So essentially the heat equation with the boundary governed by a scalar OD. Uh, that model arises in phase change, change problems. Uh, but while historically the interest had been in phase changes like water to ice and back, and, and uh, possibly crystallization systems in chemical process control. Uh, the most recent interest uh, of, uh, in this model uh, arises from additive manufacturing, or as uh, it is more frequently referred to as 3D printing. Uh, so I'm, I want to emphasize applications. I don't want a theoretical pre uh, presentation to go to waste uh, without bringing uh, to our colleagues, uh, bringing uh, to our colleagues uh, to the attention uh, some interesting applications. Uh, so, 3D printing uh, for metals is done in a rather interesting and challenging way. Um, the metal uh, starts in a powder form. It's a ground form. Uh, a laser pulse delivers energy and converts this metal into a liquid. And then that liquid cools and solidifies. And um, uh, an object can be formed uh, using a particular process that is not fully described here uh, through this conversion, through this com uh, repeated conversion of, of uh, powder into liquid back into metal. Uh, just to be clear, uh, the powdered metal is repeatedly applied uh, above the solid, and then uh, the, the part of the powder that is above the solid is turned into, into liquid and resolidified. That's, that's how the process of uh, laser based sintry works. Um, a model for this uh, that has relatively recently emerged is the uh, uh, Stefan model. And here it is represented only in one dimension, even though, in fact, the process is certainly three-dimensional. So I will focus on the one-dimensional uh, model of this. What I will do first is rotate uh, this uh, vertical axis by 90 degrees so that rather than um, the um, liquid being above and the solid being below, liquid will be to the left and the solid is on the right. The control input is this laser pulse, which enters uh, the left boundary of this one-dimensional uh, distributed parameter model. And what we're interested in is applying this boundary control uh, to impart a desired effect on the uh, temperature profile of the liquid and the solid. And you see here, uh, a possible temperature profile where to the left of this interface S of T, we have a solid and the temperature is above the melting temperature Tm, but non-constant in space. And to the right of the uh, liquid solid interface, we, uh, we have um, a solid metal 
and uh, the temperature is below melt. Uh, to start simple and clear, I will um, assume that the temperature in the solid is all at the melting or freezing temperature. In other words, I will not consider the dynamics in both uh, phases, but only in the liquid phase. I will come back to, the, um, to both phases a little later. What is the control objective? The control objective is to regulate this interface position, S of T, to a right, uh, desired position. In, the, in other words, to melt just the desired amount of uh, solid and place the interface at the reference point SR, reference or set point as sub subscript R. Um, if the uh, objective uh, of the control design is to regulate the state, uh, this, this one-dimensional state, uh, the, the position of the um, interface to a desired value, the question is, what is the implied objective for the, uh, uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the temperature profiles? And the desired objective, and this, this is maybe slightly non-obvious, non but, but very important to uh, appreciate. The, uh, the desired objective is actually to bring the temperature of the liquid exactly to the melting point. In other words, to, uh, to the verge of freezing. It is only at that time that the interface has a chance of starting, or, uh, has a chance of stopping the movement to the right and melting even more solid. <clears throat> so to summarize, the task of the control design is, uh, is to apply the heat flux on the left and to achieve the asymptotic uh, regulation of the interface uh, to the set point SR, as well as to uh, regulate the, uh, the liquid temperature to the melting point. So not surprisingly, the dynamics of uh, the temperature in the liquid are governed by the heat equation. It's as simple as that. It can get more complicated in, in other um, uh, 3D printing processes in which there is actually a motion of, the, of the, either the solid or the liquid and there is convection, but here we keep it as simple as possible for the beginning. The, the domain uh, is a moving, is a varying domain. The uh, spatial variable varies between zero and S of T, where S of T is up to the full length uh, capital uh, L that, that uh, both the liquid and the solid occupy. The input is on the left boundary, X equal to zero. So it's a boundary control problem. And um, the uh, temperature at the liquid solid interface by physical definition of this, this process is at the melting or the freezing point. And finally, there is one more equation. In addition to the PD, there is a scalar OD. And that OD governs the position of the um, the solid liquid interface. On the right of this OD, there's heat flux, the spatial derivative of the temperature. It is the heat flux at that very point. So that is what drives the, uh, the motion of the interface. The important thing to note here is that Tx is a function of x and x is evaluated at s, and s is the state of the scalar OD. So this is actually a nonlinear OD, as well as being time varying. So while everything seems linear, it's actually not. It's, it's a nonlinear system, at least uh, the uh, OD part of it. Finally, uh, if you're used to thinking of uh, PDs as infinite dimensional uh, differential equations 
And if you're thinking in terms of their finite dimensional approximations, um, because of the moving boundary, that finite dimension is actually varying in time all the time <clears throat> during the transient. So it is really difficult to think in terms of all the approximations for uh, this class of Stefan problems. Finally, since the objective is to drive S to the reference SR, uh, the right hand side of the system needs to have some damping that favors uh, the error S minus SR, but that damping isn't there physically. The system is neutrally stable, but not asymptotically stable at the, at the reference point S equals SR. So the control design has to introduce that. Um, unfortunately, uh, there is no control input to be applied right at the interface. The control input acts on the opposite boundary. It's an anti-collocated situation, so to, so to speak. So we need to impose this, uh, this damping at x equals s from the position x equal to zero on the left boundary. So how to overcome this? I think everybody on, on this call knows that the answer will, will be in backstepping because, uh, because of this uh, 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 remoteness between the output of the system and the input of the system. So let me just summarize the structure of this system. The structure of the system is, is a cascade, a cascade of a heat equation feeding into an ODE the simplest kind, a scalar OD. Let's not forget that uh, that's actually um, a generalization from something simpler and more familiar, uh, namely systems with input delays, where uh, that delay is uh, the simplest kind of a hyperbolic PD, the transport PD. So it's, it's, it's a generalization of that problem that we uh, deal with in this situation. So let me get, get straight to the answer to the question regarding the control design. <clears throat> After a backstepping design, one arrives at the feedback law given here. So it is feed, it is, uh, it is control being applied uh, through the heat flux QC on the boundary X equals zero. And it is feedback of the temperature, which is being integrated uh, in space X uh, over the state-dependent interval 0 to S, where S is the or the state of the system, and also linear feedback of that S itself relative to the reference value SR. So this is the, the result of a backstepping design. When you see something relatively simple, simple of this, uh, as this, you, you have to wonder, you know, uh, is there something more than backstepping hiding uh, in this formula? And the answer is actually yes. So this simultaneously happens to be an energy shaping control law, where the energy that I'm talking about is the specific heat, which is uh, the quantity on the left, and the latent heat. Uh, I bet there, there are very few among us who are experts in thermodynamics and to whom these terms mean something. So let me, let me define this very uh, briefly. Uh, specific heat uh, represents the um, amount of heat that the uh, liquid needs to lose in order to uh, cool down to the freezing temperature. That's what this integral of the temperature error over the liquid domain is. And the latent heat, this, this, this linear term, is the heat that a solid segment of this length, S minus SR, or rather SR minus S, because SR is greater than S, needs in order to melt. So these two types of energy are both potential types of energy. One is related to uh, to warming the liquid up. The other one is related to changing uh, 
solid into liquid. So it happens to be both a backstepping design and an energy shaping design, which, which uh, folks from, from certain areas of distributed parameter systems, maybe port Hamiltonian systems will, will appreciate on that account. What does this control guarantee? The control uh, guarantees uh, exponential stability in the H1 norm. Uh, and this exponential stability is not merely local. It's actually global in the H1 space of temperature profiles above melting. In other words, this holds for all initial temperature profiles where the entire liquid temperature is in the liquid range, namely above melting. Uh, now, in addition to stability, uh, the controller has an additional task of not violating physics and, and the controller fulfills this, uh, this task. In other words, this control law guarantees that the uh, liquid temperature above, uh, remains above the melting point. It sounds like a trivial statement. It's not a trivial to, to establish statement. It takes, takes an argument uh, through, uh, through the maximum principle and it takes establishing that this um, heat flux will always be positive. The controller will never try, try to cool. Uh, if, imagine if one were to fail at guaranteeing that uh, there is stability, but the, the, uh, the temperature doesn't remain above TM all the time, you would actually be uh, allowing the creation of islands of solid within, within the liquid and the model would, would no longer be valid as a, as a one phase step and model. Uh, just a quick comment about the proof. Uh, there are two, two things to prove. One is uh, that uh, the temperature uh, remains above melting. And I mentioned already that that's done using the maximum principle. Uh, the stability study is done using backstepping. And I will just show one little part, part of, of that whole proof. Um, uh, the, the study starts with a change, trivial change of variables uh, relative to the equilibrium values, the, the melting temperature is, and the set point uh, value for the interface. And the key step is uh, the backstepping transformation shown here. You see here that uh, what is being transformed is the um, temperature error state. There is a Volterra transformation here uh, of um, U. Uh, U is being trans uh, transformed using a Volterra uh, integral on uh, itself. Uh, and in addition, there is, uh, there, is, um, there is a term related to the interface. So you see that this is um, capital X is S minus SR. So this term here is a quadratic term in uh, S in the interface uh, position. Um, one last thing I want to emphasize here is that the kernel of this Volterra transformation is neither something totally trivial, like a constant kernel, nor something very complicated, like, uh, like a Bessel function or, or at least hyperbolic uh, sign or something like that. Uh, but it's simply a linear function in the um, spatial variable error x minus y. Why is it a linear function? The linearity of this function comes from the nature of the ODE. The ODE is a heat equation. It's a second order equation uh, in uh, the spatial variable x. And it is that that brings, um, brings a linear kernel function into the backstepping transformation. Uh, the rest of the details I uh, will skip. So what can one do with this control law? So believe it or not, uh, Schumann Koga, in addition to all of these theoretical results, has even developed an experimental test of all of this. And since uh, uh, doing experimental tests with laser-based sintering of metals uh, requires um, uh, extremely complex 
sophisticated and expensive uh, experimental facilities that do not uh, exist at more than just a few uh, universities. Schumann resourcefully replaced metal by something that melts at nearly the room temperature, and that's paraffin. If I recall, it melts at right around 100, but I don't remember, uh, I think, no, definitely, uh, 100 Celsius, not, not, not 100, 100 uh, Fahrenheit. 100 uh, Fahrenheit would be, would be around uh, uh, 37 uh, Celsius. So um, uh, he has done this experiment and demonstrated uh, this feedback law in regulating the uh, melting position of essentially a very, very fancy um, wax candle, so to, so to speak. Um, another interesting application of uh, this design has been in Arctic sea ice. So we all know that the polar caps are melting, that this is one of the, the great environmental concerns for the humanity. And, and you see how the uh, thickness of the ice cap has declined over the past uh, 35 or so years. The model of that is the Stefan model, but uh, it's not a single phase Stefan model. Uh, you actually have to model the liquid as well as the solid, the sea ice. And then there's also snow, which is yet another uh, distinct phase. So I'm showing you here something that is uh, not as simple as the theory in the previous, uh, in the previous slide. I'm showing you <clears throat> uh, a model uh, with at least two phases uh, and in which the objective is not control because we cannot really uh, actuate. We don't have uh, the actuation power over uh, uh, to, to refreeze sea ice. Uh, but the problem being considered is actually an estimation problem, uh, an observer design rather than a, a boundary controller design. Uh, there are certain boundary measurements that are feasible, such as uh, the position of the um, the, uh, the position of the uh, ice water interface, which is uh, done using sonar uh, measurements as well as the position uh, of the interface between the snow and the ice. And uh, the observer is given here. For those of you who are familiar with backstepping, you know that uh, it's a completely du dual design in which uh, rather than designing the kernels of uh, um, Volterra type operator, for a backstep in transformation and ultimately for a boundary control law, what's being designed instead is uh, the gain functions of the Sluenberger type observer. Those functions uh, are designed. And uh, let me show you uh, an implementation of this uh, observer. So first the model. Uh, uh, back in 1971, detailed measurements were, were done at the Arctic, and this is what the um, uh, what the water, ice, snow, and air profile looks over a one-year period. So this is the period of one year. You see January through December here on the top, whereas on the vertical axis you see see the depth, and uh, you see that during the winter the ice is thick. There is snow on the top. During the summer, the snow melts, uh, the, the ice starts melting, uh, the ice gets thinner, and then it gets, gets thicker again in the, in the fall and uh, the winter. This is, on the left, is a simulation, and it shows roughly uh, the same, the same uh, uh, spatiotemporal profile of the um, water, ice, and snow. Uh, these two slides show the estimation using, on the left, 
a copy of the system. A copy of the system is a successful estimator because in the absence of uncertainties, this is, uh, this is a stable system. And given enough days for the estimation, uh, the states will converge uh, to their actual values, which uh, change slowly. So it's, it takes about two weeks to, for the estimator to catch up with the uh, dynamics of the system. Um, on the right is a performance of the backstepping estimator, and that estimator catches up with the actual values in about a day. So it's, it's a 15-fold um, acceleration in the uh, estimation relative to the open loop um, copy of the system estimator. Let me see, I, I, I've, I've noticed some things showing up on the chat. I don't know if there are questions that I should, that I should try to respond to right away. No. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so let's move on. Let me now tell you just briefly about an extension to a two-phase step and system. So uh, both the additive manufacturing where we have an actual uh, solid metal and liquid metal and the uh, sea ice are two-phase step and problems. So I'm returning to the two-phase model and reintroducing a PD for the temperature dynamics in the solid. So in addition to this liquid plus the interface or the model. Uh, I'm now introducing the, um, the model of the solid temperature dynamics, which is yet just yet another heat equation. As, as uh, this note indicated, uh, in the presence of a solid, um, the interface position needs no longer move monotonically, only rightward. Um, so how is this problem approached? Uh, the problem could be approached in principle in two ways. Maybe some measurement of the uh, heat flux on the far end at x equals L can be done, and this could be treated as a cascade of a uh, PD, OD, PD, but that's not, that's not how Schumann has approached and solved this problem. He has instead introduced a new system output. He has changed the previous system output, which is the um, position error for the interface, S minus SR, by adding this specific heat in the solid. So he has introduced the um, system out output, which is the total energy error and then proceeded with the design given that output. I will not talk about the design here. I just want uh, to comment on the structure of the system. So the system to be controlled now is just the liquid phase, but with this non-standard output that includes um, the solid phase. So for that, we already know how to design a controller because the structure is the same as the, as the solid structure before. But the analysis has an uh, extra twist. In the analysis, one needs to account for what happens to the solid. And you see that the dynamics of the solid are these V dynamics, a heat equation, but with S, which is a part of the output. Uh, S is actually a combination of the, of, of, of the regulated output and of this function of V. This being the inverse dynamics or zero dynamics for, for those of you who uh, have plenty of training in, in feedback linearization and, and nonlinear control. Or the numerator 
of the transfer function for those of you who who uh, like to think in in um, in those linear frequency domain terms so the heat equation being stable for the for the solid uh, makes us lucky that we simply need to control only this total energy uh, of of the solid phase along with with the uh, interface in order to stabilize the entire system liquid solid and interface let me now switch from uh, this parabolic discussion to a hyperbolic discussion um, so this is work by Huan Yu uh, and uh, it relates to an application in uh, in control of traffic flows in the congested regime. Juan has many results on uh, on the topic of uh, congested traffic and uh, most of them involve multiple coupled first order hyperbolic PDs which model uh, the density and the velocity and fall into the category of all Russell Zhang models. This particular topic is not of that kind. This particular topic is, is just a single uh, hyperbolic PD model of the so-called LWR part. But let me start uh, by describing the, uh, the traffic in uh, this, uh, with this simple diagram. So when you are in congested traffic, you're, you're very uh, much used to the situation that you're driving, driving, and all of a sudden you have to slow down because it's congested ahead of you. You arrive at a shock, and that shock is moving. That shock is actually a state of the system, and I will denote it, I will denote the location of that shock uh, as L of T. So the density, uh, ahead of the shock is high, the, the density behind the shock is low. Uh, the dense traffic we call congested, the sparse traffic we call free, and those are very formal terms. They have a mathematical meaning. Uh, they're not just heuristic uh, descriptions of how we feel in such traffic, but, but they, they have a very particular mathematical meaning in, in modeling of, of traffic using PDEs. So what is the actual model? Um, the, the, uh, the model is a first order nonlinear hyperbolic PD model of the LWR uh, um, uh, type, Lighthill with them Richardson uh, model. Uh, and there are two parts of this model, one corresponding to the free portion to the left of the shock and the other corresponding to the congested portion of, of traffic. So take a brief look at the, the, this model. Uh, the state is the density rho of the free traffic. So rho subscript f, that's the state of the system. This is a variable that is distributed. It depends on both uh, the position of the, on the freeway x and time t. There is one derivative, but it acts on, uh, on a quadratic function because um, uh, the so-called fundamental diagram of, of traffic is something that, uh, that is not linear, but, but uh, in the simplest approximation can be modeled as quadratic. So this sort of Burgers-like, so to speak, uh, equation is the model of uh, the density in the, in the free regime. And exactly the same model uh, models uh, the density in con congested regime. What differs, though, is that once you perform the calculations around the equilibrium and linearize, you see that the convection of the linearized quantity of the um, fluctuation of the density relative to the low density equilibrium in the free traffic and high density equilibrium in the congested uh, traffic convects in the opposite direction. Uh, the um, perturbation or fluctuation of the density in the free regime is in the downstream uh, direction, which is kind of obvious, whereas the, um, 
the convection in the congested regime is in the upstream direction. So the cars move in the downstream direction, but the perturbation of density moves in the upstream direction. And uh, the um, interface, the shock, moves typically in the upstream direction. Uh, this movement is a behavioral movement. It's the movement that results from uh, drivers stepping on their brakes and the drivers behind them getting a little scared, startled, stepping on the brakes and this, this way propagating uh, in the direction um, behind them. So two identical um, first order hyperbolic PDEs but with, with different directions of, of transport. Uh, since I was talking about uh, solids and liquids, you can, you can truly think of this as analogs of liquid and solid. We can think of the free traffic as being, the, uh, being a liquid and uh, the congested traffic being denser, being the solid here. Finally, there is an OD. This OD models um, the, the position uh, of the shock. Uh, it's often called the, uh, the Rankin um, Egonio uh, jump condition. And you see that it is quite similar to uh, the bound, uh, to, uh, to the Audi modeling the uh, liquid solid interface uh, in the Stefan problem with only one difference that there are no der derivatives with respect to X in here. So it's not flux that drives uh, the position of the, um, of the interface, the shock uh, position, but it is the densities that uh, drive it from both the left and the right, from both the congested and the free side. So what does one want to do with control? Well, one wants to essentially prevent the entire uh, freeway being consumed by congestion. And that negative uh, outcome is shown here with this dashed red curve. So after about 55 seconds, the whole freeway has turned congested uh, in the absence of control. So what we want instead is uh, for us to, to um, keep the position of, of this shock in control at some desired value. And that desired value is, is arbitrary. Uh, what do we have? Um, what do we have? Let me see if I, hmm. okay, I'm missing one, one slide that I intended to have here, doesn't matter. What we have at our disposal are the boundary conditions uh, on both of these PDs. Um, I can explain that here. A boundary condition at x equal to zero and the boundary condition at x equal to L. We can control the densities at these two boundaries. Uh, how is that physically done? The densities at the uh, boundaries of a freeway segment can be controlled using ramp metering. What is ramp metering? You've, you've probably gone through metered ramps to the freeway. Uh, those are those places where you, where you stop and you wait for a uh, red light to turn green. And uh, controlled ramp metering would not uh, have constant intervals of red, uh, red and green, but would have intervals of red and green vary, or the ratio vary in accordance with a feedback law. So imagine an interval of traffic that is, that is um, half a kilometer long or several kilometers long, and two ramps uh, at both ends of, um, of that uh, traffic segment and uh, traffic lights controlling the, the, um, the release of cars onto the freeway. Just to, to clarify one more thing, uh, it's pretty obvious how the release of traffic on the left end, on the upstream end of the freeway influences the density. That's kind of obvious. It's a little less obvious that releasing cars at the downstream end has any effect in the upstream direction. 
but it does. Remember, as you're driving on the freeway and, and, and a car gets on the freeway from a ramp, and you see that car and you start wondering, will that car merge safely in front of you? What do you do? You brake. Once you brake, the person behind you brakes. So that's how that ramp has had an effect on the traffic through you and through the person behind you all the way um, upstream. So those are, those are the control inputs. Uh, let's now look at this system, which I've represented uh, here by two PDs and one OD. Let's approximate that system uh, for clarity of concept, to, to, to be clearer than what, what uh, the system of two PDs and one OD allows us to be. Let's clarify things by, by linearizing them uh, and uh, by uh, converting this um, system of two PDs and one OD into a system of one OD with two inputs that have distinct delays on them and where the delays depend on the state. So please see these two uh, quantities. Uh, the delay DF, the delay of the free regime segment, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is proportional to uh, the uh, position of the shock and the delay in the congested segment of the freeway, uh, which is proportional to the negative of the, um, um, which, which decays with, with the position of, of the shock. Uh, if a state X is int introduced to be the error between the actual shock position and the set point, then one arrives at the simple integrator with two inputs, which are delayed by different amounts. But those two uh, different amounts are simply distinct functions of the same state, x of t. And how does one approach that? Well, once uh, the system is represented uh, as a system with input delays, one can proceed with backstepping or one can proceed with, uh, with predictor feedback, which is essentially the same for that class of uh, systems. And one arrives at these two feedback laws. So what are these two feedback laws? The one on the top, which, is the, which controls the density at the inlet into the um, freeway segment, is the prediction of the shock position over the free or upstream segment. In other words, uh, it's uh, the prediction of where the shock will be at the time when the um, input signal, namely the ramp metering modulation of density, reaches the position of the shock. So that's, that's what uh, these added integrals do. They predict where x will be once the input uh, gets to X, gets to capital X. And likewise, uh, the bottom expression is the same kind of a prediction, but for the congested part. And here are the simulation results. The simulation results, uh, the, uh, the plot on the left shows the evolution of the density over time and space. So the spatial in interval is half a kilometer. The inlet into the freeway is, um, is here. This is the left boundary. This is, this is where the uh, car and the cars enter. Uh, they exit at the 500 meter mark. And as we look at this density, over the time axis, we see that um, the uh, dense traffic in the downstream regime uh, gets denser and denser in the upstream direction. And this shock moves upstream. And by the time of about 50 seconds, the entire uh, um, freeway segment has turned congested. We want to prevent that, we want to maintain the, um, the shock at some desired tolerable position. 
And uh, uh, that is what is achieved using ramp metering at both the, uh, uh, the inlets and the outlets of the freeway. So you see this plot, which uh, essentially allows the shock to only move from about the 350 meter mark to maybe 250 uh, meter mark, and it is maintained there. This, I believe, uh, is my last slide. This slide tells you what is it that we can actually guarantee besides the simulation results there. And what we can guarantee is stability in the H1 norm of the um, exponential type. We can guarantee it locally. We cannot guarantee it globally. I've not seen a single result of uh, global uh, being achieved for nonlinear hyperbolic uh, PDs or for ODs with state dependent uh, delays. So with that, let me thank you for your attention and uh, I'm happy to have a discussion and try to answer any questions.